Welcome, everybody. We have a fabulous show for you today. We're going to talk about the financial services industry, and we have two of our exceptional women awardees who are leaders in that industry. We have with us today Jane Marcus. Jane is a senior client partner at Corn Ferry in Chicago. She has been placing people on boards and in senior level positions in the financial services industry and other industries for 30 plus years. Jane also has a very successful consulting coaching practice within Corn Ferry, where she takes care of and helps the very senior clients of that amazing firm globally. With her, we have Shiruti Miyashiro, who is the CEO of the Orange County Credit Union. Shiruti is an amazing executive who also sits on the board of a public company, Jack Henry, and she is the chair of the compensation committee in that company. She is also on the board of the Federal Home Loan Bank and, and running her multi-billion dollar company. She has her hands full. We're going to learn a lot from both Shiruti and Jane today. I'm Lorraine Siegel. I'm the founder, chair, and CEO of the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. Our mission is to enable high-level women like Shruti and Jane to reach their dreams. Why did I start this foundation? Well, I never had a mentor when I was early in my career, first as a lawyer and then as CEO of multiple companies, and even as a board director, I never had a coach. And I wanted to be sure that women who walk the road less traveled as I have would always be surrounded by a supportive network of peer leaders who would enable them to reach their dreams. And so that's exactly what we do at the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. And so it brings me great pleasure to introduce you to Jane and Shruti, our guests for today. Welcome, ladies. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. So happy to have you with us. Okay, Jane, I'm going to go straight to you. Did you always imagine when you were a little girl that you would be in the financial services industry? <laughs> and how did that happen? <laughs> no, I wanted to teach math, which you probably don't even know. I um, didn't know that. I knew about the clown stuff and about ballroom dancing, but we'll have to come back we'll to, get that. to that. We'll get to that later. So, um, no, I wanted to teach math, but I, I really didn't have any guidance about careers or anything like that. I knew I was going to go to college. I, I went to college. I went to what was back then a girl's school. Still had really no idea. It wasn't until I switched from technology to um, to go to business school where I learned about executive recruiting. Nobody really knew about it then. Certainly it wasn't discussed at Kellogg. But um, when I was trying to figure out what to do for my summer internship, I saw a notice on the wall of the placement office, uh, office and it was for an intern to support a senior partner in financial services. And I thought, this is great. They're going to help me find a job. So I you know, went over to Russell Reynolds, and that was in the summer of 86. I'm dating myself, and I, I never left the industry. I just found that it was an amazing industry, a great way for um, you to perform, do well, and get ahead, and you know, with very little uh, hierarchy. And so ever since then, I focused on the asset management sub-industry uh, within financial services and continue to do so today. That's amazing, Jane. Okay, well, we'll deal with the clan thing now because the Ringling Brothers little picture behind you, tell yeah. us what that's all got to do with Jane Marcus. Um, well, when I did go to college, um, I, I did study math, but I also had a real fondness for performing arts. And so I also got a degree in theater arts. But um, at the end of my, or close to the end of my first year, I thought, now this was the 70s, you know, you could do anything. And I really always loved clowns. And I thought, well, what the heck? So I applied to clown school. And this is, I, I'm the best person with this secret at a cocktail party because nobody could ever guess this. Um, the funny part about it is I didn't get in. And I do have to add that it's a very, um, it, it's very technical and you have to be a tumbler and, and gymnast and whatnot. And I didn't have those skills, but that's my, uh, that's my secret. Wow. That's amazing. And nobody would ever guess. Definitely, I know you're a good ballroom dancer, and that's something that is a great exercise. So tell us a little bit more about that at the end of the show. Okay. I do want to get to, to Shruti, though. Shruti, did you dream about being in the financial services industry when you were a little girl? 
So parallel lives with Jane <laughs> minus the clown school part. Uh, definitely don't have that experience, but um, did not necessarily want to teach math, but I was the little girl who thought she could do everything and therefore had no clue what she was going to do. And so my job was accidental in that I was an undergraduate student studying philosophy, planned to pursue a master's degree in hospital administration, but with a philosophy degree, again, you can do anything or you may end up doing nothing. I was very lucky that my part-time gig that turned into full-time working at a local credit union, just six months in, I was 21 years old, and they promoted me to being a branch manager. So very young to the professional workplace, management, and then I just thought I'd kind of hang out and see what happened with this gig and see if it would turn into a career. And here we are all these decades later. So very lucky with that accidental landing place for me. That's amazing. So many people do belong to credit unions, but some people who don't, don't know the difference between credit unions and banks. Can you help us with that? Absolutely. It is the most wonderful intersection of all the breadth and depth and qualities of, ser of services, products, etc. There's this amazing complexity to running a credit union because they are by definition not for profit. So while we're not working on quarterly numbers for Wall Street or earnings calls, there's still a need to run a strong business in a not-for-profit environment with the same challenges of fintechs, cybersecurity, regulatory environment. All of the challenges and intellectual challenges are there, but at the same time, the purpose being very people-centered. So the projects that we work on tend to be very people-centered before ESG was a common thing. And so you're able to focus on the workplace that's created for your associates, and the community impact product design for those uh, customers who bank with us. It's just a beautiful intersection of purpose and complexity and intellectual acumen. I have never heard it described that way, Shruti. How beautiful is that? So Jane, you have something you call crack the code in financial services. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, that's a great question. So cracking the code is is really a number of things. And um, I think, first of all, you have to stay relevant. And that's probably the case in any industry. You just have to be a continuous learner and you want to be relevant. You want to continue to work on yourself throughout your career. So one of the traits that's most important throughout leadership and, and really even all the way to the top is self-development knowing that you can grow and always be working on yourself. I would add knowing the traits that are important to success, whether it's your role or the role that's next in line or where do you want to be in three to five years. And then one of my favorites is really building your own advisory board. And that's critical. And this is this could be part of an EWA. This could be individuals that um, you've gotten to know through work or through other relationships, but this is a group of individuals that can really be your mentors and your Sherpas as you continue to progress in your career. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. You've overcome a lot of challenges, uh, Jane, in your career. Can you outline a couple of them? Because I'm sure that people out there, and by the way, to our audience, do put in your questions and tell us what you want us to answer. We'll be happy to do it on the air. Jane, some of the challenges you've overcome and, and advice on that? Well, um, gosh, you know, I was the, I am the mother of two boys and I was a single mom for most of their life. And, and my role requires a lot of travel. So I would, and I worked in New York officially, so I would be on the road from Monday or Tuesday through the end of the week. And that's tough, you know, it's tough to leave your kids. It, it's tough to manage the communications and, and whatnot. But, um, you know, I always did the best that I could do. I think another challenge was generally always being the only female at the table um, and, you know, working within an industry that was fairly male dominated in, in a business financial services and in the business uh, executive search, which was fairly male dominated. And to secure your seat, um, not necessarily wear you know anything on your sleeve in, in terms of having an attitude or an edge, but um, do the best to know yourself and be confident and to speak up. 
Jane, has it changed, Jane, in the 35 years? And, and where are we now, do you think, with that? Yes, that's a great question. Um, yes, it's changed. Um, it, not much, though. Um, so I and, and I ask young women this all the time because I had my kids kind of the first of my my age group in executive recruiting that had kids. Uh, I ask the young women now, how is it? What does it feel like? And and they're still having a lot of the same challenges. Um, I think the good news is that there are more of us. Um, there are more of us that are filling the ranks so that, that we can be mentors. And, and I think that that's what's important for us to continue to pay it forward. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's, it, that's happier news, but not as happy as we'd like it to be. Trudy, right. you, you have a beautiful son and I'm sure you encountered some of the same challenges. What are your thoughts on, on that and how did you manage? Well, I think like Jane said, like most um, women, especially in the generation where there weren't as many remote work opportunities. We, you know, as wives, as mothers, as daughters, sisters, etc., we had a feeling, we were taught that we could do it all because the opportunities were there. But with that came the pressure of, can I really do it all? And am I doing enough? And am I good enough? And I certainly struggled with that as both a wife and a mother. Um, I was fortunate to have an amazing husband who made my job easier, who made the self-doubt easier. But at the same time, um, when you're one of the few working women who do have to travel, you wonder, are you doing the right thing for your family, for your values? And so I think what helped me was pretty young, when our son was pretty young, I took a step back and I really tried to picture, okay, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, fast forward your life, what should it look like? What matters? And for me, it's always been the people in my life and the purpose of the work I'm doing. So it hasn't been about chasing a title. It hasn't been about some of those definitions of success. And so that allowed me to then prioritize. I'm a CEO during a great recession. I'm a CEO during a pandemic. It is all hands on deck. It is long hours. It's everything to focus on the business at this critical time. On the other hand, when our son was 14 years old, he voluntarily wanted to go to an East Coast boarding school. And so young, far away on the East Coast, my son, our son was on emergency bypass. It didn't matter what kind of meeting I was in, if he rang, I answered. So having that kind of understanding of my priorities based on what was happening in my life has helped me determine where do I need to pay attention now based on what's happening and based on my priorities so that a decade or five decades from now, I feel pretty good about the overall choices I made. Maybe not every single one, but overall I got in the direction I wanted to go in. Yeah, we are not perfect, any of us, and we all still make mistakes, but we do the best we can. You know, one of our advisory board, Joyce Russell, who is the chair of the foundation of ADECO, which is a 26 billion uh, services staffing company, uh, said on one of our uh, shows, and I always say this after it, because Joyce, thank you for that, 10, 10, 10. Will your decision, what will it feel like in 10 minutes, in 10 months, and in 10 years? And I think that that's basically what you said, Trudy, is that you have to think about not just now, but the short, medium, and long term. And, and those decisions can be very difficult to make. It gives you some perspective. Uh, Trudy, back to you for a moment. You went on a public board when you were very young, and tell us how that happened. It's, you know, I've been very lucky. It's been the theme of my life, having these opportunities very young. So I was a branch manager at 21. I was a CEO in my 30s at 35, and I went on a public company board at um, 44. So very young. And what's interesting is all of those opportunities have happened without me being on LinkedIn. I literally just joined LinkedIn a few months ago and without me knowing how to golf. So really quite an anomaly because I don't have the normal skill sets that are needed. Um, all of them though, each of these opportunities have come from knowing people, particularly the public company board. And the differentiator for me is that my network is really based on my deep curiosity about other people. Who are they? What do they enjoy? How do I learn from them? What I get to know each person on a much deeper level than a surface level. 
So I think that has helped me, and that's just a genuine curiosity and an authenticity I bring. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that has helped me is my definition of success is not a title. So whether someone achieves a public, public company board seat or a CEO title or not, does not define whether the career has been successful. So each time in my career, I've not chased the title of CEO or the title of public company board seat, but I have chased the opportunity to keep learning, to keep growing, looking at the broader world, looking beyond my four walls and looking out. And so that ability to learn from others and I think authenticity of relationships um, is unique, but it makes me who I am and it's served me quite well. So I'm thankful for that. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Kimberly just uh, put up something that said uh, great advice, and I would agree with that. Yeah. Thanks, Kimberly Reese and uh, Shruti. I agree with that. Uh, Jane, you have taken a, a very interesting movement in your career recently, and you are such a people person. I know that many of our EWAs uh, turn to you for all kinds of career advice, and you've now become a very well respected executive coach within Corn Ferry. Tell us more about why you decided to do that. Well, um, I think like Shruti, it's, I've always been really curious about people, which worked perfectly for my career in executive recruiting. And I have really great and strong relationship skills. So I think that a real turning point was years ago when I was chatting with a CEO of an asset management company who I've known for years. And at the end of our conversation, he said, you know, Jane, I always feel better when I've spoken to you. That was, you know, when he said that, I just thought, you know, there's something else here. And it was coaching. So I really just thought what an opportunity to take all of what I've done throughout the 30 years and really apply it in a discipline that I had not done formally. So as you know, Lorraine, I am now doing half-time board recruiting and half-time executive coaching, and it has been such a journey. Again, Shruti, you said, you know, curiosity. It's I've been in Columbia's program for executive um, uh, coaching, and just the the discipline and the the curiosity that I've been able to experience has been fantastic. Amazing, and. Uh... And your value is just, it, it increases every day. We have a question from Kimberly Reese. So uh, can we put up that question? Um, she says, oh, I love this, Kimberly. Thank you. I don't agree that women need to learn golf to play relation, uh, to build relationships with men. Do you agree? And how do you recommend women create relationships with men off the golf course? And we're not talking about uh, anything but business relationships here. Okay, Shruti, go ahead, because you said you built these wonderful, deep relationships. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more with what Kimberly said, because I don't know how to golf, and yet some of my strongest mentors have been men, both men and women. But I think, again, going back to being who you genuinely are, if you golf and you love it, golf. If you don't, it's okay, because remember, that time, golf is a hard game to learn. All that time I would have spent learning how to golf would have been time away from my family, my husband, our son. So I channeled it in a different way and I built relationships very differently. Um, one of my strengths on Strength Finder is um, individuality. So I'm curious about the individual and that has been helpful to me. I think it's important to be who you are, not who you think you need to be to fit a mold. And we're seeing that ability emerging much more now than we did in decades past. So if you're not a golfer, don't worry, you'll still be incredibly successful in your career. It'll be in other ways. Yeah, I'm a failed golfer, so <laughs> I appreciate what you just said. Uh, you know, Shruti, you're on a, a public board. You're also on the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Uh, those are two very different boards. And then, I'm, Jane, I'm going to come to you because I know you place people on boards all the time. But explain to us what the Federal Home Loan Bank Board is all about, because it's not the normal kind of public board. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating, the types of boards I've served on. I've been on a hospital board, a college board, lots of different boards. The public company board, of course, is SEC, publicly traded, lots of information. The Federal Home Loan Bank is fascinating because there is still SEC oversight, 
But if that wasn't enough, we also have regulatory oversight from banking industry. And if that wasn't enough, you also get oversight from the federal, from the FHFA, Federal Housing Finance Agency, mm -hmm. which oversees Fannie, Freddie, and the federal oh. home loan bank system. So what we've got is incredible regulatory oversight, even deeper than most financial institutions would face with F SEC oversight. And then the Federal Home Loan Bank was created post-depression to help with affordable housing, which is incredibly important and still hasn't been solved to this day. So you've got, again, this concept of a mission, but a heavily regulated business from all entities. And it is a fascinating case study in um, bureaucracy, opportunity, and need. I can imagine how how regulated is that? I mean, how do you ever get anything done? Is uh, would be my question, but you don't have to answer that because that's a loaded question. Um, I will go to Jane though, because Jane, you place many people on boards, both men and women, and so many women uh, we know and are in EWA and other groups want to get on boards or want to get on more boards. What's your advice? So I, I start off with manage your expectations, and that's really important. So it's key to know, to be realistic about what kind of board you can be on, be realistic about what kind of skills you bring. And I guess before even that, I would say, understand why you want to be on a board. So what's driving you? Is it this perception? It's kind of like, again, what Shruti said about she didn't want to be the CEO because of the title. Do you want to be on a board because you want to give back, because you're intellectually curious, or are you really wanting to get on a board because you feel like it's a stamp? If it's the latter, I think it's going to be hard for you to be on that board or on a board because people will see that. So manage your expectations. Um, network. Network. You don't have to play golf. You need to network. You need to be in situations where you can meet people and know your elevator pitch. Know your couple of sentences of what kind of board you want to be on so people can help you. And then understand governance. Lorraine and I have talked a lot about this. Get governance training. Get training. Take a class and come prepared. Yeah, NACD, National Association of Corporate Directors. I served on the board of the Pacific Southwest group for nine years, and it's a phenomenal place uh, to get all the training you may need to be on a board, to serve on a committee, to chair a committee, even to be a lead director. So you definitely do need to put the time and effort in to make that happen. Um, and I think that the managing your expectations is a hard part to, to analyze, really, Jane, because I think now with a lot of the laws changing and women feeling that it's their time to get on boards, uh, there are a lot of women who are very well qualified, but there are a lot of women who are not and still want to be on boards. What do you say to them and how do, how do they get to put their expectations into reality? Well, I talk about, it's a great question. I talk about, um, I talk about their background and First, I talk about ask them why they want to be on a board and what kind of board they think that they should be on. And I talk about the reality of where you start. And if someone has not been on a board, you need to start at the beginning. And I, it's training wheels. You need to think about maybe you go to your alma mater, maybe you do something in your community, but you need to get some credentialing in terms of an experience about being on a board. And once I start having that dialogue with someone, then I might bring in some examples of some of the work I've done and the individuals, the women or others who we've actually recruited onto the boards. And it gives them a sense, I think, of, boy, maybe that's not quite me. And, and that helps. That helps manage the expectations. Yeah, you did a wonderful session, which we call EWA Speaks for our network and sisterhood. And you talked about the fact that very often there are very specific requirements that a nominating committee wants, like, for example, somebody who's run a PL in China, somebody who is an academic, somebody who has specific cybersecurity experience. So, yes, I think that's really good advice. We have a lot of questions out there, and unfortunately, we won't be able to take all of them, but let's put up at least one or two. 
so that we can give some answers to our audience. Um, here's one that came in from Darla from New York. And Shruti, she wants to know if you would encourage young women to go into financial services and where would she start? Without hesitation, I would say yes. I mean, the complexity and intellectual challenges of working in financial institutions, whether it's the global view or the community view, are very exciting. And now what we're seeing is financial services start to focus, like credit unions, but start to focus on a social mission, on the people. So the communities they serve, the customers, commercial banks, small businesses, and individuals. And so there's a really nice intersection, again, as I said earlier about credit unions, but now for the broader financial services sector to focus on purpose as well as complexity of business. Mm -hmm. And so I would definitely say yes. I think in any job search, as Jane said earlier also, it's a good idea to do a self-assessment of yourself first. What do you enjoy? What are you good at? Do your introspection. And then from there, taking those skills, reaching out to your network, reaching out to recruiters to say, here's who I authentically am. I, Shruti, am a very bad golfer, bad hand-eye coordination. And if that's a requirement of a job, that may be challenging. On the other hand, this is what I'm really good at. And where would that be a good fit? The good news is in today's market, it is absolutely an employee's market. So if you have an honest self-assessment of what you bring to the table, what kind of environment brings you fulfillment, and then you've got a network and group of people where you're able to really see where those opportunities are. It's a good time for a good match. And women are finally getting their seats at financial institutions and in the sector now. Since 2018, I think the number of women in C-level seats, C-level seats at financial services is close to 40%. We're making inroads, so it's a great place for women to be now. That's amazing. And Dala, you're in New York, which some call the, the center of the financial industry. So there's going to be a lot of places for you there to hopefully find your way. Uh, I know there's a few other questions. Let's see if we can squeeze some in. Oh, Derek from San Diego. Jane, why was coaching interesting? You seem to have a successful career as an executive search consultant. So I guess the, the question after that is, why would you take that kind of risk to move into uh, executive coaching? I didn't see it as a risk. I, I saw it as a wonderful opportunity to to learn, to apply what I have been sort of giving away um, all these years and to really do so with discipline. So the program that I've, I've been working in in Columbia, it's um, very research based. So it's been fun to go back to school. And um, I feel so rewarded and fulfilled in this part of where I'm focusing. It's just been, it, it's been a real treat. Lucky me. Yeah, lucky us too, because we get the benefit of that. I think there are a few more questions. One, let's see, is coming up for, oh, here's one. Um, Molly asks Jane, she's been working in investment banking and has an MBA from Wharton. She wants to move into financial services, into management. Uh, so what skills would be valuable for that? So there is a combination of uh, functional skills and, you know, interpersonal skills. So functionally, you could be in you could be in a financial analyst role. You can be you can go up through distribution. You can go up through operations. You really in financial services. You can get into management from any number of levels. The question is, what are your core competencies functionally? So you'll have to leverage those to make the move into financial services. In terms of making the move into management, what's really key is the um, ability to collaborate. It, across the board, across the level, collaboration is at the top. Um, driving results over your career is critical. So a track record, instilling trust, have people that trust you is one of the key drivers of a strong management profile. Uh, Self-development, I think we mentioned this early on, really understanding who you are and those areas that you need to work on throughout your career. So it's really both the functional skills and the interpersonal skills. That's a great answer, Jane. Okay, quickly, we've literally got one or two minutes left. Jane, ballroom dancing. <laughs> so, you know, um, traveling is a lot, having being a single mom is a lot. And I realized at 50, I wanted to do something for myself. So I went to the Fred Astaire closest to me 
And um, within months, I was dancing and competing. And I spent years traveling all over the country uh, competing in, in ballroom. And I have loved it. And I have found clients on the dance floor. I have found fast friends on the dance floor. And I've just got my husband dancing, as you know, um, in the last month. I love that. I love it's that. not clown school, but it's dancing. <laughs> it's good enough. It's good enough. You know, we run we run out of time, ladies. So I'm so sorry that uh, we can't continue. But to Fruity, Jane, you're a terrific guest. We've taught us a lot. You're going to teach us more. I know as the years go on and we'll have you back. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really. Thank really you. Thank you. And of course, we are not uh, we're not done because we have another show coming up for you very soon. And we are going to feature two more of our exceptional women awardees. We have Rachel Barger. Rachel is the senior vice president for global enterprise sales for Cisco. And with her, we have Diana Hoff, who is the senior vice president for operations. She's an oil and gas engineer, and she is with Antero Resources. The two of them are engineers, they are leaders, they are superstars. We're gonna learn so much from them. Please join us on our next show. And of course, I always leave you with a question and I have a question for you today. After we heard from Jane and Shruti about many of their challenges in their industry, I would say that what they have done is surround themselves with people who are incredibly smart. So I will ask you, have you surrounded yourself with people who are smarter than you are? And if not, why not? please respond to me. My email is going up on the screen as you see it now. Make sure to look for us on Amazon Music. We're on Spotify. We have a YouTube channel. We hope to see you on our next show. Thank you so much for being with us, everyone. Bye now.